The Canadians is produced in association with the CRB Foundation Heritage Project and brought to you in part by Altamira. This is a good time to be an Altamira investor. Patrick Watson, the program is called The Canadians, a series of biographies of the nation. When I was a boy, the dinner table, which convened every afternoon at six o'clock sharp, was as much a forum for storytelling as it was for sharing a meal. My mother and father, both teachers, were consummate storytellers, so were my older siblings. And I grew up thinking, that's what you do when you grow up, you tell stories. One of the ongoing stories that my dad used to bring us, sometimes with books attached so that we could pursue them further, was about a wonderful conservationist and naturalist called Grey Owl, an Ojibwe. Dad had grown up in a community on Ontario's Lake District where he knew a lot of Ojibwe, and while I don't think he actually met Grey Owl face to face, he used to talk about him with such immediacy that we felt we, we all knew this austere mythic figure. And so it was something of a shock when the truth came out. And I seem to recall my dad with tears in his eyes when he told us about it. Here is the legend of Grey Owl. By the late 1930s, he was the most famous North American Indian in the world. The son of an Apache mother and a Scottish trapper, he was everything the public thought an Indian should be. Mysterious, impassive, enigmatic. He would uh, sort of look at the mirror and try to look stoical and sort of... He did look the part. Noble, stoic, dark. Uh, it's a dye that uh, he would put on. He was so popular that when he went to Britain on a speaking tour, everyone wanted to know what he'd be wearing. So he went in front of the cameras to tell them. On my buckskin shirt, I wear a beadwork pattern of the maple leaf, Canada's national emblem, and the emblem of a beaver, Canada's national animal and my patron beast. And I will carry these very proudly there across the sea. The 1937 British tour was such a tremendous hit that the King of England ordered a command performance where Grey Owl entranced the royal family for three hours as he told them of the land that had formed him, a land far from the gentility of Buckingham Palace. It is a land of shadows and hidden trails, lost rivers and unknown lakes, a region of soft-footed creatures going their noiseless ways over the carpet of moss. And there is silence, intense, absolute, and all-embracing. I came out of the shadows to speak my message, and into the shadows I shall return. I am Grey Owl. I have spoken. A few months later, the royal family would discover, with the rest of us, that the most famous Indian in the world had no Apache blood whatsoever, and his father was not a Scottish trapper. In fact, he'd been born and raised in the English seaside town of Hastings. And his real name wasn't Grey Owl, it was Archie, Archie Bellini. Of all this century's great stories of fraud and deception, Grey Owls is one of the richest a middle-class English boy transformed into an Aboriginal legend. And it starts in 1903, when the famous Buffalo Bill brought his Wild West show to England. In Hastings, Colin and Betty Taylor run the Grey Owl Society. Buffalo Bill was very popular in England. Um, they, uh, he came over here and uh, to England and traveled around Europe 
uh, many times, and he was extremely popular. I mean, he came to London in 1887, and Queen Victoria went to see the show. He then, in fact, came to Hastings in 1903, and that's when Archie Bellaney actually saw, saw Indians, I suppose, for the first time, it would mm. be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. it would be. Yeah. For a magical weekend, the English seaside town was transformed into the Wild West. There were cowboys and horses and Indian dances and sharpshooters. Even as a toddler, young Archie had told his schoolmates that his father was a cowboy in America. After 1903, he'd add a few more details, telling all who would listen that his dad was now touring with Buffalo Bill. In fact, as most of the adults in the small holiday town knew, George Bellaney was an alcoholic ne'er-do-well who had gone to America to make his fortune, only to return within a couple of years, bankrupt, and with a 17-year-old bride already pregnant with Archie. He was born in 1888 in this house at 32 St. James Road, Hastings. But by the age of two, his natural parents handed him over to be raised by his father's sisters, a decision from which young Archie would never recover. Biographer Don Smith of the University of Calgary. How does he explain he has no where his father is, where his mother is? It was very awkward. And particularly, I think, in England at the turn of the century, in a very class-conscious kind of situation, very embarrassing. So my theory is that he invented this persona, this story, which goes back right to his youth, of having a father who was in America with Buffalo Bill and a mother. Well, he didn't elaborate so much on that in Hastings, but in Canada he would. He, his mother became an Apache Indian. This starts in Hastings as a young boy, and I think it's a compensation for the lack of his... A, a really a, a father and mother. Young Archie would go through his childhood asking where his father was and what he was doing. And his aunts would consistently avoid the question and try to raise him as a young English gentleman. They were very kind and thoughtful and they did everything they thought was right for him and he had to dress in his Eton suit on Sunday. Obviously they had to go to church. I, um, it was a very sort of regimented life, really. I encouraged him to play was. the piano. Of, of course, course, he played. Yeah. He had, you know, piano lessons. It was a very middle class, staid upbringing. There was no great fun. Although he was a good student and won the highest class marks for English at Hastings Grammar School, young Archie Bellaney was a handful for the two maiden aunts. They wanted him to be a doctor. He wanted to be an Indian. He left school at 15 and begged to be sent to Canada. Instead, while his classmates went to work at the seaside fun fair, the ants found him a job at a local lumber yard and hoped he would soon come to his senses. But when he lowered a bag full of fireworks down the chimney so that it exploded in his boss's office, even the Bellaney sisters realized that perhaps Canada would be a good place for him after all. Seventeen-year-old Archie Bellaney arrived in Halifax in the spring of 1906, and within a few months he was heading north to learn to be a trapper and a woodsman, and to set in motion the groundwork for the legend that would be Grey Owl. Archie Bellaney surfaced in northern Ontario in the fall of 1906, doing kitchen chores at the new Tomogamy Inn. Occasionally, he would help the local trappers and guides, and he quickly learned to handle a canoe. By the summer of 1908, he was also in love. Angela Guana was beautiful. He told her that he would make a white woman out of her. Angel declined the offer and said instead that she would make an Indian out of him. He met this young Ajibwe. Indian girl who befriended him, who taught him the Ojibwe language, who taught him about trapping. It was his first contact with North American Indian life. They married and had a, a, a daughter, Agnes. Archie and Angel and their daughter settled in with her traditional Ojibwe family. He grew his hair long and learned to speak passable Ojibwe. He was soon given the name Washakwan Asin, which normally would translate as white beaked owl perhaps a reference to the famous Bellini nose. 
Archie chose instead to translate it as he who walks by night, the name he would later evolve into Grey Owl. But in 1911, the young Englishman who walked by night simply walked out on his wife and daughter. He wasn't really the kind of fellow to settle down, and he certainly had no idea what a family was, He'd been abandoned by his own parents. So he left her, actually, when their daughter was a year or so old. And he went farther west to a place called Biscotasing, a uh, hundred miles or so farther west. So as a, he really wasn't, there wasn't really anything to admire in his early life, abandoning his wife and child. Biscotasing in northern Ontario now has a population of 28. But when Archie Bellaney came here in the years before the First World War, Bisco was thriving. He soon settled into the hard-drinking, hard-living life of the trappers and the rivermen and attached himself to the Espaniels, an Ojibwe family who continued his education in the ways of the woods. Alex Espaniel became an adoptive father figure, and the daughter, Jane Espaniel, would remain a lifelong friend. The Ojibwe poet Armand Rufo, author of The Mystery of Archie Bellaney, is Jane Espaniel's grandson. When I asked my grandmother, I said, well, Grandma, did you know he wasn't uh, native? And she just laughed and said, oh, that Archie. If, um, we just let him go on. We didn't pay it any mind. In fact, in fact we, you know, she, she indicated that they, they, because he wanted to be native, they just helped him to be native. You know, at that particular time, there was native people have always adopted non-natives into, into their tribe, into their community. So it, was, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Bisco was the town that Archie Bellaney would call home for nearly 14 years. He had various jobs as a fire ranger and railway worker and trapper, but most of the time, he was looked on as just another local drunk. He lived with a Métis woman, Marie Gérard, and had a son named Johnny. But then in 1915, he again walked out leaving his new family as destitute as he'd left Angèle and Agnes. Archie had enlisted with the Canadian Army, telling the authorities he was a good shot and used to handling a gun. He also said that he was an Indian. They sent him to the Western Front as a sniper. Within a few months, he'd been shot in the foot and sent back to England to convalesce. Later, there were rumors that the wound was self-inflicted to avoid the war, but that was never proven. To cut down on travel time from the front, the Canadians had taken over several convalescent hospitals on the English coast. He was assigned to the one in Hastings. By a fluke, Archie was home again. During his boyhood, he had known a young woman named Ivy Holmes, the daughter of his aunt's best friends. Ivy had grown up over the years and had toured Europe with a dance troupe. And they fell in love and they married in 1917 in England. So there he was. He had, was actually still legally married to Agnes, the Ojibwe wife. He'd had this Métis, rela uh, Métis relationship with a Métis woman, and now he was marrying Ivy Holmes. So uh, it was really, that was, again, you, there's not really terribly a great amount to admire in his early life. Archie told Ivy that he would leave first and arrange for her to come to Canada as soon as he got settled. She neither saw nor heard from him again. Back in Bisco, he learned that Marie Girard had died of tuberculosis, and their infant son Johnny was being cared for by a local family. He ignored the child. And later, Johnny Gero, as he was known, would grow up to refer to Archie Bellaney as Archie Baloney. He calls him Archie Baloney, you know. Um, Again, this contradiction. One hand, he's very caring and very concerned for the environment and and the uh, and animal life, and in another hand, he can be so callous with his own uh, with his own um, offspring. Archie Bellaney comes back. He lives in Bisco Tasing for about seven years. Uh, again, n nothing to report that uh, puts him in high standing. He's heavy drinker. He's throwing knives. He's he's confused. The war threw him, as as it did for many people. The the carnage of the war, the senselessness of the whole thing. Uh, he was a very confused individual. Life returned to normal in Bisco, and by 1920, the local residents were bemused when Archie performed his own particular war dance. 
It had probably evolved from the Buffalo Bill show, but he claimed it as his own, and then added some drumming and singing, confusing the local Ojibwe and Cree elders who hadn't seen anything quite like it. Now, these are very sophisticated uh, North American Indian things. I mean, drumming is, you don't, he, he didn't know, he didn't practice with Indian drummers or anything. He didn't know anything about the singing, and it was all wrong. In the summer of 1925, a warrant was issued for his arrest. He'd been throwing knives at passing trains. I think it was drunk and disorderly whilst at the uh, Bisco station or something. <laughs> It was time for Archie to leave. He went back to Angel. She would give birth to their second daughter, Flora, early in 1926, but Archie wouldn't be there. He had abandoned her again, and this time, he never came back. The Ontario government had banned trapping to all non-natives in 1925, so that only those registered under the Federal Indian Act could continue to trap and sell furs. Archie joined the small exodus of trappers who now moved provinces and started laying their trap lines along the Quebec side of Lake Tomogamy. Working as a waitress in the local hotel was 19-year-old Gertrude Bernard, whose nickname was Pony. Archie, now age 36 and a veteran of the backwoods, was in love again. She was an Iroquois, but she'd lost touch with her native roots. He would later Indianize her name, calling her Anna Hario. He told me that his mother was Apache and his father a Scotchman, and that they lived in uh, Hermosillo, Mexico, I think it was. And, uh, oh, well, that's, uh, that is about all he ever said. If I had a suspected anything like his being an Englishman, I... I would have uh, tumbled a lot of things, you know? At the end of the summer in 1925, the young Anna Hario was scheduled to attend the posh convent boarding school, Loretto Abbey, in Toronto, to be sponsored by two rich American tourists who had befriended her. It would have changed her life. Archie persuaded her instead to spend the winter with him. With all due respect to the other women in his life, I, I think that she truly was the, the great, that was the love of his life. He's the same man who's able to bring 3,000 people to his readings. So he's, he's obviously very charismatic, and I think she gets captured in that, in that romantic persona. I mean, when f he first shows up, he's wearing a, a sash, and he's got his, his fedora or a hat pulled over his, you know, one corner on a slant. Uh, he's got a scarf, a silk scarf around his neck. I mean, he's, uh, he's a romantic, and, he, and so is she. He even has a silver six-shooter. And uh, literally, he, uh, I would say he sweeps her off her feet. And uh, so she ends up with him. Yes, she, she gives it all up. She was convinced that he was what he claimed to be, a native trapper. But Anna Hario was about to turn an unknown backwoods immigrant named Archie into the internationally renowned conservationist known as Graham. Anna Hario, Gertrude Bernard, had never been on a trap line, had never seen the cruelty of it. When she went out with Archie Bellaney in the winter of 1926, she was appalled. That's a cruel business, you know. You, you, when you come upon a live animal and he's stuck there and you take your belt axe and club him with the hand, uh, handle, you know, and that's pretty, that's pretty bad. Grail became a conservationist thanks to Anna Harriot. It's because when they were trapping in, in, in northern Quebec, it was quite clear that the beaver was becoming so depleted that in that area it seemed they might be wiped out entirely and they trapped two adult beaver and Anna Hario spotted the two kits that had been left and they would certainly die if they left on their own. So she convinced them to, uh, they would raise them, the beaver kits, and that's how it started. The beaver kits were christened McGinnis and McGinty. They would raise them as their own. Archie Bellaney began to lose interest in the kill.
I began to have a faint distaste for my bloody occupation. These beasts had feelings and could express themselves very well. They could talk, they had affection, they knew what it was to be happy, to be lonely. Why, they were like little people, and they must all be like that. To kill such creatures seemed monstrous. I would do no more of it. He promised Anna Hario that he would give up the trap line forever, but they hadn't figured out how to make a living. They scraped by on his meager army pension, and at one point set up a tent and charged people 10 cents to see the beaver he had tamed. He had written to his aunts, sending them a picture of Anna Hario, referring to her as my wife Gertie, and announcing that she was an Iroquois chief's daughter. The aunts probably gave his return address to his mother, and an exchange of letters took place in the summer of 1928. His letters were so well written and lyrical that Kitty Bellany sent them to Country Life magazine to see if they'd publish them. They didn't, but they did commission an article. Archie sent them an essay called The Men of the Last Frontier. Suddenly, from the wilderness, there was a new voice, a voice that had never been heard before. I get the impression that he always wanted to be a writer. He would record times, dates, what the weather was like, the people they met, the animals they encountered, the shoreline, what it looked like, um, the conditions of the water. He would just take copious notes. So once he uh, meets Anna Hario and he gives up the, the trapping and the, the life on the river, he suddenly has all this time on his hands and he has no income, so he makes use of all these notes. And he starts writing these articles and he writes a small article, sends it off to Country Life because, of course, he's British. He knows that this magazine's out there. I mean, if you're a native person living in the bush, would you really know that Country Life magazine is, <laughs> is out of England? But he knows. In reply to questions from his British editors about his origins, Archie claimed that he had been adopted by the Ojibwe and that for about 15 years spoke nothing but Indian. By the middle of 1931, he was claiming he wrote solely as an Indian. He presented himself as a North American Indian because he knew that would attract attention. If he came on as Archie Bellini, Northern Canadian trapper, so what? It attracted attention and he had a message which he wanted to deliver. And he did it, the beaver was the symbol. The beaver was the thin edge of the wedge, he called it. The beaver would attract public sympathy for the conservationist movement and it would expand from the beaver to other, other species and to the whole wilderness itself. McGinnis and McGinty, the two beaver kits, had become a major focus in their lives. But trappers had been moving into the area. And one day, the beaver pet simply disappeared. Anna Hario and Archie were heartbroken. They searched for days. And when he wrote about the loss, it was as if it were the loss of his own children. And at last we knew that they were gone forever, into the darkness from whence they came. And they left behind them no sign, no trace. And the aged trees, whose great drooping crowns loomed high above our heads, omniscient in the wisdom of ages, seemed to brood and whisper and look down upon our useless vigil in a mighty and compassionate comprehension. For they were of the wild, as we were, the wild to which in our desolation we turn for a solace and a refuge, that ageless wilderness that had ever been and would somewhere always be long after we had followed our little lost companions and were gone. His writing had come to the attention of the Canadian Parks Department. They were anxious to promote the new government parks and to use short films to advance their cause. Grey Owl was offered a job with the Parks Department and given a cabin in Riding Mountain National Park, Manitoba. I think the park saw just a natural. He was a person of part Indian ancestry. He was uh, photogenic. Uh, he could communicate. He, he had a, a track record. He could write. He, uh, they, they, he was, they made films of him with the beaver. They were successes throughout the British Empire, throughout the English-speaking world. They, this man, had, 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 he was just perfect for the role. Officially, he was paid as a parks ranger. 
but his job was to be a movie star. He now had two replacement beaver, Jelly Roll and Rawhide, whose antics were soon captured for a worldwide audience. He called Jelly Roll King of the Beaver until Jelly Roll suddenly gave birth. Then he simply referred to her as Queen of the Beaver. No one noticed. The movies featuring Grey Owl and Anna Hario and the Beaver were an enormous hit, and soon he was being asked to lecture with them. He had finished writing his first book, commissioned by Country Life, and released in 1931 as The Man of the Last Frontier. The Times Literary Supplement would say that it was difficult to recall any record of the Great North which was so brilliantly and lovingly handled. The Canadian Historical Review called it extraordinarily vivid. Grey Owl had arrived. By 1932, the Parks Department had moved Archie and Anna Hario out of Manitoba to the recently opened Prince Albert National Park in Saskatchewan. They built him a cabin, which he would soon call Beaver Lodge, on the shore of the remote and beautiful Lake Adjuwan. He built a special entrance for the beaver, who shared the living space. However, not everything was as peaceful at Adjuwan as it might have been. He was drinking more and more. A cache of empty bottles of vanilla extract would later be discovered near the cabin. To the people who lived in the community, having a famous author in their midst wasn't exactly what they'd expected. Margaret Conabare remembers as a girl hearing stories about the antics of Grey Owl and Anna Hario from a local lady who had a small cabin in the area. She was out in the summer kitchen and she could hear shots being fired out in the woods. And it wasn't hunting season, this was strange, so she decided to go and investigate. I say she was about four foot ten, I think. Anyway, she went tromping out to the bush to find out what these shots were about and came across, she saw Pony Rosanna Harriel sitting on a tree stump with a rifle taking pot shots at Grey Owl's heels, chasing him shooting just behind his heels, chasing him from tree to tree. He was hiding behind the trees, and she was just sitting there and chasing him, and they were both drunk as skunks. She must have been a wonderful shot. <laughs> Anna Hario and Archie had a daughter, Dawn, who was born in Prince Albert in 1932, but she wasn't raised by her natural parents. She was handed out to the local Winters family in Prince Albert, who raised her as their own, while her natural parents would, occasionally, visit. Margaret Winters was a teenager when Dawn Bellaney was left at her household. She came to our place, and Mom had to go and buy all the baby clothes. She didn't have anything. And so from then on, she made that her home. And he always said he wanted Dawn to be brought up like our, our family were like me, I was the only girl. He saw her whenever he could, and being at our place, any time he was in Prince Albert, he knew he could be with her, and uh, Anna Harry used to take her to Waskasu, where he could see her there, and even up to the cabin. So he, he was in contact with her as much as he could, living where he did. There was no place for a child that would get sick in a hurry, and because it was just too far away. Now there were rumors that the relationship was in trouble, that Grey Owl and Anna Hario would often come to blows. They did exchange blows, and in fact, in one letter he says, I know, I'm sorry for howling and uh, carrying on the way I did. And then we see elsewhere where he writes to, I, I believe it's his publisher, Lovett Dixon, um, we are finally broken up as Anna Hario tried to choke me for 40 minutes or something like this. So, so they're, you know, they're, they're exchanging blows, if anything. Anna Hario was disillusioned. He was no longer the backwoodsman she had married. When he announced he was going on his first speaking tour of England, dressed as an Indian chief, Anna Hario didn't like it. I was quite aghast uh, when he said he was going to go as an Indian chief to lecture in England. I said, why not go as the woodsman that he was? He says, they expect me to be a, a, an Indian. 
I'd stand on my head if I knew that uh, people would listen. And besides, if, if the lecture was a, a flop, I'd have at least given them a show for the money. Dawn was only a year old when Anna Hario decided to leave Grey Owl and Adjuan. She would occasionally revisit and even spend short times with him at Beaver Lodge, but the marriage was over. Well, Anna Hario left Grey Owl because I think the writing, uh, she, uh, the writing was too much for her. He was constantly at his desk in, in the mid-1930s writing books. She was a woman, of, a young woman of action. She wanted more in life than being a, connected with a, a pen. Uh, it, just, it just wasn't, she was, she prospected, she, she eventually just the strain became too much. She did not want him writing all the time. She wanted a full life. So they split, split and uh, it would be very painful for him. That's, that's without question. But I think that he recognized that they was just they just weren't operating in the same way anymore. Archie Bellaney had first left England in 1906. Now, 29 years later, Grey Owl was going back. The 1935 tour of England was a hit. His book, Pilgrims of the Wild, telling how Anna Hario had turned him from trapper to conservationist, was a bestseller, and the British public were lining up to hear his message. In Britain, which was, like Canada, hit terribly hard by the Depression, uh, these industrial towns and whatnot, he'd come and he began his lectures with, he would bring forward a maple leaf, I bring you a green leaf. That's how he'd begin his lectures. And it was very, very powerful. And then he'd show films about the wilderness, about the beaver and, and the northern forests. And it was very, it was such an escape. It was, it was so fresh, so pure, so welcome after the hardships of the 1930s. If he ever worried about being exposed as a fraud, he didn't show it. In fact, he occasionally got carried away with it all. He actually told the press that if beaver kits were orphaned, Indian women would breastfeed them through infancy. As beaver are born with a full set of teeth, that was more than a little unlikely. By the time the tour was over, Grey Owl had established himself as Canada's major international celebrity. He returned to Adjuan in 1936 and started to work on a new book, Tales from an Empty Cabin. Anna Hario was gone. He hired Margaret Winters to type the manuscript and she moved with her brother into the second small cabin at the lake. He would read um, parts of the book to us, what he was writing, and how does this sound? He'd say, now I need a word to go in here, and we'd be going through things to find a word for him, you know, but he was quite relaxed about it. But he did his writing at night while we were in bed, and uh, that's when the beaver were up, and he was with the beaver. And then he would go to bed in the morning and I would be typing. And sometimes I wouldn't be able to read a word. His writing was, was atrocious. And I realized now why when I start reading about him, because he was left-handed and his aunt made him change to write. The manuscript completed, he directed his energy at the government, trying to persuade them that the native people of Canada should be hired as game wardens in the national parks and that something should be done to stop the development he saw happening in the North. Hilary Russell spent her career at Parks Canada and took a particular interest in the life of Grey Owl. He had an enormous sense of loss and a sense that the wilderness as he knew, that he knew and loved was vanishing. And that's expressed in, in nearly all his writings and that more we needed to live with more respect with the, with the, wild things and in wild lands and stop thinking only about the present and about money. And that was, that was I guess, the strongest message. And I think he had to express it very forcefully to, for him to be heard because it wasn't a message that many people were hearing. You know, we tended to measure progress in terms of trees cut down, dams built, um, or, you know, s how many skins had been 
conveyed to market rather than how much wilderness had we protected, how many, you know, what species were say had been saved from extinction. That didn't seem to be a benchmark anybody was working with. In Ottawa, after his first British tour, he had met a French-Canadian woman, Yvonne Perrier. Now he started to court her. He told her the usual story, that his mother was an Apache and his father Scottish. But this time, he added some detail, claiming that his father's name was McNeil, from the Scottish island of Barra. Yvonne fell for it all. They were married in Montreal. Grey Owl swore to the local authorities that his real name was Archie McNeil. That was another one of his little spin-offs. He, uh, because of this Bellaney thing, he, the parks can pay him as Bellaney. That's pretty confidential. But he doesn't want to circulate that name Bellaney in, in the press stories about his background. So McNeil becomes the, the name. And um, he's even got it to McNeil's of Barra, I think it was. The, <laughs> it's a, he's got it pretty well fine-tuned. But, but it, when he married Yvonne, I mean, honestly, he's, he's still legally married to Agnes uh, as Archie Bellaney. It's it just, it just, it's just a very, it's all he can do at this point to sort of throw the, <laughs> the any investigation, any investigators off the track. So indeed, he was Archie McNeil when he married Yvonne. He took his new wife to northern Quebec, where he made his last film. Funding was almost withdrawn when the producers found out that Grey Owl was reporting for work every morning, already drunk, and in the parks department there was a move afoot to fire him. He was becoming, to some officials, an embarrassment because of his, in public, in, in, in Prince Albert, some excessive drinking bouts and irresponsible behavior had uh, annoyed them. And he was almost, for some, in some size, uh, reached the point where his services were no longer needed. He was drinking far too much. The stress was catching up. It was too late to go back. He had kept his secret from everyone, unable to tell the truth, even to his wives, and perhaps now, even to himself. He f suddenly found himself this household name, this popular person, you know, on two sides of the Atlantic. He had no idea he was going to become so famous or so successful and so popular, and he suddenly was. And what do you do if you're suddenly in that position and you, you, you can't really stand up to and say, oh, well, hold it a minute, I'm not really an Indian. I was born in Hastings in Sussex in England. I liken it to, to him being on a, in a canoe on a river. I mean, it starts off slow, slow, and he can get off, he can paddle to the side, but he doesn't. He just lets it escalate a little more and the current starts getting faster and faster. First thing you know, it's going so fast he can't get off. Cracks were beginning to show in the elaborate armor he had created. In North Bay, a reporter for the local newspaper, The Nugget, had tumbled onto his real identity by talking to Angel, his first wife. But because they admired his work as a conservationist, they decided not to publish. I think today this is a remarkable story. His editor said, put that story on hold. We can't publish this, that with this man who's doing this good work and he's so famous. And you think, compared with an editor today who would instantly think nothing about ruining somebody's life with a headline. I think that's remarkable. Yeah, I thought that was smashing. Plans were now set for a second British tour to take place at the end of 1937. Inexplicably, he demanded that his hometown, Hastings, be added to the itinerary. He was risking everything by going back to the town of his childhood. So he decides to go back to Hastings to, to see if he can pull it off, to see if, if he, if maybe to confirm that he's actually native now. And he's gone to such a point that people won't even recognize him. And also, I think, to simply see his aunts, to show them who he's become. So he takes the chance. The aunts who had raised Archie Bellaney were about to get a visit from Grey Owl. The British tour of 1937 was an even bigger success than the one two years earlier. He was now so popular that he was invited to perform at Buckingham Palace. Protocol demanded that the king be the last to enter, 
but Grey Owl threatened not to go on unless the king and everyone else were seated before he made his entrance. George VI decided to humor him. I suppose he was a family's man and he didn't want to disappoint his children. So the king um, says, okay, we'll do it that way. And of course, uh, palace officials are just, you know, in pandemonium because this has never been done before. But the king uh, agrees and uh, Grail walks in and greets him and, and he, he even clasps his hand and shakes his hand and that's never done. So he breaks all, all protocol. <laughs> Grey Owl entertained the future Queen of England and her family with films and stories and introduced Yvonne to the Queen Mother as the Mohawk Princess Silver Moon. She was, of course, French-Canadian. Then, as he prepared to leave, he stunned everyone again with another major breach of protocol. Customarily, or actually absolutely, the King leaves first. But on this occasion, Grey Owl put his hand on the King's shoulder after being asked to stay longer and said to him, I guess I'll be seeing you, brother. And he laughed first. I'll be seeing you. I don't know. I, I, don't know. I think he was a uh, pretty easygoing sort of fellow. And I think that he would be good fun to have around. Maybe I don't think a... he was overawed by anybody, oh, particularly. No. It didn't bother him too much. I mean, he, he, he was he'd... pretty sure of his ground, I think. Perhaps he'd had a stiff <coughs> drink before he went to the palace. Oh, yes, he liked his, because uh, liked his drink, didn't he? he? Um, was quite a heavy drinker, especially as he got in his later years. For the book promoters, the Royal Command performance was the highlight of the 1937 tour. But for Grey Owl, there was another performance which would be a lot more stressful. On the morning of December 15th, he put in a rare appearance as Archie when he visited his two aunts for morning tea. They were proud of his fame and popularity and promised that his secret was safe with them. Later that day, he went on stage at the White Rock Pavilion, looked the people of Hastings in the eye, and told them about his life growing up in the wilderness. It was the best performance of the tour. He must have uh, really wanted to do it. I guess this is a, a culminating moment in his career, to go back to his hometown as a North American Indian. It, it, it's, it's very, it was very chancy, wasn't it? Uh, one person did recognize him, and this came out in the paper after his death, but uh, no one at the time came forward. It, there was an uncanny resemblance between Grail and Archie Bellaney in this uh, one woman's eyes. Although later there'd be some finger pointing in his hometown, Grey Owl left England early in 1938 with his reputation intact, but his health seriously deteriorating. In the last several weeks of the tour, he had been drinking steadily, but eating only two raw eggs a day. The speaking tour continued in North America at a killer pace. And in early April, when they finally got back to Saskatchewan, Yvonne had to be admitted to hospital suffering from exhaustion. Grey Owl insisted on going back to his cabin, but after only a few days at Adjuwan, Parks Department Rangers took him by sled to the hospital in Prince Albert. Three days later, on April 13, 1938, he was dead. The autopsy showed he had died of pneumonia. He was 49. The same afternoon, the North Bay Nugget finally published the story they'd been holding, showing that Grey Owl was really the English-born Archie Bellaney. Grey Owl's death was a big story because first the tragedy of this great figure dying, and then the second story kicks in that his real identity. It's a wonderful story because you've got a, a, a great conservationist, and at the same time as an extra, you've got the story of someone who changed their identity. And that fascinated the public in Britain, the United States, and Canada in that midweek in April 1938. And finally, by the end of a week, it was traced down. The North Bay Nugget provides the first clues, which are followed up, and eventually the Mrs. Bellaney are contacted. Ivy's found in England, and uh, the story is out. It's not that strange that he did what he did. Not so, you know that people do it. They pretend they have ancestors they never had. You know, concoct a life for themselves they wish they had. He, he just managed to succeed better than many others in becoming the person he wanted to be. At the end of it all, 
Whether he was really an Englishman named Archie Bellaney from Hastings or was indeed the noble gray owl from the land of shadows matters little. Archie Bellaney is dead, but the legend and the spirit of gray owl live on. You belong to nature, nature does not belong to you. I mean, it's still something we could learn from today. We must learn from that today. It's a great accomplishment, I think, to take a story of a troubled and often irresponsible figure like Archie Bellaney and draw us into that life so intimately that despite our discomfort at the faults and, and the delinquencies, we come to care about him. And in this case, to recognize that drunk, bigamous, fraudulent though the man may have been, his legacy was what he put himself into with the most focus and care and intention the waking up of the world to wilderness and wildlife. I'm Patrick Watson for the Canadians. The Canadians is produced in association with the CRB Foundation Heritage Project and brought to you in part by Altamira. This is a good time to be an Altamira investor. Mm -hmm.